Okay, I think we can start. First of all, good afternoon, everybody. It is a great pleasure for me to um, open this event on uh, European foreign policy in turbulent times. Does differentiation make the European Union a stronger actor? Question mark. Uh, this event has been organized by the Finnish Institute for International Affairs in the framework of the EU IDEA uh, project. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank very much Juha, Jokela and all his team for the great organization uh, and also for the collaboration within uh, the project. So, um, as you have probably um, seen on the basis of the program, we will have an opening by Federica Mogherini, followed by a panel discussion moderated by Juha and animated by our great team of UIDEA researchers. Uh, before we start, let me just uh, say a few words about our project and also the main objectives of this uh, um, event today. So first of all, EU IDEA, uh, European Union Integration and Differentiation for Effectiveness and Accountability. Sorry for the, you know, uh, very difficult acronym, uh, perfectly in line with the EU uh, style. Uh, so we started from the uh, recognition that differentiation has become a new normal within the European Union. And um, however, a, a number of unprecedented challenges facing the European Union reinforce the belief that some kind of flexibility is needed uh, to the complex European Union machinery. So we think that differentiation can finally offer a way forward for the uh, European Union, especially in those fields where uniformity is not uh, uh, desirable or attainable among member states. And we try to offer uh, manifold models of cooperation between the European Union and third countries uh, on this uh, assumption. The goal of the project is uh, to address whether, how much, and what form of differentiation is not only compatible with the governance of the European Union, but also conducive to a more effective, uh, cohesive and democratic European Union. Of course, we are aware that this means addressing a number of challenges that are connected to differentiation. First of all, the compatibility with the core principles of the European Union, but also its sustainability in terms of governance and also accountability vis-a-vis uh, -vis European citizens. Uh, we started our research uh, two years ago already uh, with uh, 15 partners within and outside the European Union among the universities, uh, think tanks and uh, media partners. And we are funded, of course, by the European Commission through the Horizon 2020 uh, program. Have the honor to uh, coordinate this amazing group of researchers. I would like to thank them very much for the work done uh, so far. So today uh, we would like to uh, focus a bit more on a, a one of the aspects we address within the project, which is the uh, differentiation in the field of foreign and security policy of the European Union. Uh, in the project, we examine the institutional arrangements and also policy practices of differentiation in the fields of foreign security and defense policy. And in particular, uh, we um, analyze both the treaty-based uh, mechanism of differentiation in uh, CFSP and CSDP to evaluate both their limitations and also potentials. But we also uh, focus on the, group, on the role of uh, lead groups uh, in the foreign security policy of the EU. And in particular, we assess that some case studies such as the Normandy format for Ukraine and the EU 3 plus 3 for the, for the Iranian uh, nuclear deal. Finally, we also look at the nexus between internal and external differentiation in light of uh, enlargement but also in light of the uh, many association and cooperation agreements that the European Union has established with third countries uh, in the economic and political fields. Today, in particular, we try to answer the following questions. So, first of all, when and how has differentiation advanced 
the role of the European Union in the world. Second, if more differentiation is inevitable in light of Brexit, but also in light of the many centrifugal forces we uh, notice within the European Union. And finally, what are the dangers of more differentiation that we should be aware of uh, within the European Union? In order to do that, I will uh, first uh, uh, leave the floor to Federica Mogherini. Uh, Federica does not need to be presented in our circle. She has been uh, a high representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy and Vice President of the European Commission. Uh, she's also been an uh, uh, Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs, and she's also a close friend of my institution, the Institute of Foreign Internazionali in Rome. She's now Rector of the College of Europe, and I'm very happy in this case because the College is also my alma mater for uh, European Studies. So, uh, really, I'm more than happy to give it the floor. Federica, please, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Nicoletta. Thank you uh, all for the invitation and for the initiative. I hope you hear and uh, see me uh, correctly. Good. Um, uh, well, I, I think that topic you've uh, uh, you've highlighted uh, is extremely interesting, and I would try to uh, elaborate a little bit on uh, uh, on that, including on some of the study cases you were, you've mentioned and you have addressed in the research. Uh, with the perspective of someone that has lived uh, um, them from, from the inside, I would put it this way. So uh, with less of a, an academic uh, approach and more, uh, uh, and more uh, of a direct uh, experience of a practitioner. Um, and, and also maybe dismantling uh, a couple of, uh, um, of assumptions that uh, uh, normally are considered as starting points when talking about uh, the uh, uh, constant um, tension uh, that is there between um, the strength and the consistency of uh, a European Union foreign and security policy and the fact that you have 27, at my times 28, member states with their own foreign policy, with their own security policy, with their own defence policy. Uh, how do you square the circle? Uh, is differentiation indeed something that can help square in the circle or is it somehow endangering the consistency and the coherence of the speaking with one voice? Now I'll start with the speaking with one voice. Uh, Nicoletta might have uh, heard me saying that already. Uh, I hate the expression and I never used it myself uh, and I actually always argued uh, with my colleagues and friends in the European institutions that especially in foreign and security policy we should never say speaking with one voice. Uh, because the fact of having many voices, again, now 27, uh, actually more than 27 probably, because you might have in federal states or in, uh, uh, in complex uh, government coalitions, more than one voice within the same member state, by the way. But at least having and using the 27 voices uh, is actually an asset for the European Union. Um, giving that up uh, would uh, reduce the possibilities of the Union to uh, connect with some interlocutors, represent some uh, uh, points of view uh, that have grounds in uh, history and geography, uh, the knowledge, the experience you might have about a certain issue, a certain interlocutor, a certain third country, um, is different if you live in Lapland or if you live in uh, uh, Cadiz. Uh, and this richness, this diversity, is actually uh, what makes the European Union foreign and security policy um, extremely solid, I believe. Uh, so maybe it's because I moved in this job um, uh, coming from a national background, so being a minister uh, of a member state, I always considered um, that uh, the mission of the High Representative uh, is not the one of reducing the others at silence and, and, and trying to have only one voice expressing uh, the common line, but rather that of, a, I would say, a director of an orchestra, uh, trying to make sure that the voices sing the same song uh, and that the melody uh, makes some sense uh, or at least is somehow uh, understandable. Let's put it this way. Um, this... Um, uh, brings me to say, indeed, yes, there are certain cases, in my experience there have been certain cases, uh, where uh, having uh, a differentiated approach uh, has helped uh, playing the European Union uh, role. Um, 
I have to uh, start with a preamble to that. Uh, if you are working in the European institutions, this never comes easily. Because every time that there is a differentiation process ongoing, the first question you get uh, in the press room or from inter your interlocutors is why isn't this a European Union thing? Uh, and you have to have good reasons and good arguments to explain if there is an added value and what it is. Um, so the immediate instinctive reaction, if you're sitting in Brussels, is a defensive one when never uh, a differentiated process starts. Because the immediate approach is to see this as an attempt to unity and to your own role, to be perfectly clear. Why isn't it you or why isn't it the European Union representing all? Why do these member states feel the need to go alone or in groups? Uh, so uh, it, it's never an easy uh, issue. And sometimes, uh, this uh, uh, I want to say very clear, sometimes uh, some uh, processes of differentiation uh, do some harm to the European Union common foreign security policy. So not all uh, uh, experiences of this kind, uh, in my experience and in my in my vision, uh, are actually conducive to more effective or um, or to useful um, approaches. In some cases, um, there is a, a real danger and sometimes a real outcome of disruption. When is it so? So I, I take the negative away immediately and then I try to focus on the positive cases. When is it so? Uh, it is so whenever uh, the differentiation process starts because of a, a of frustration for a lack of consensus reached. Personally, I didn't experience that during my five years of mandate. I was lucky, but I would not exclude that this can happen from time to time. And I've seen uh, this kind of dynamic potentially happening uh, more on the internal, some of the internal domestic politics um, in the European Union more than the foreign affairs ones. But because I obviously the high representative sits also in the European Council, so you see also the broader picture of the European policies uh, uh, dynamic. But in my five years, we never had that kind of uh, issue, but I perfectly know that, for instance, on the state of play of the Middle East peace process, uh, things have developed in a different direction after I left. Uh, so in that case, uh, when differentiation uh, is the result of, uh, of a lack of uh, consensus that paralyzes the decision making or uh, the initiative uh, of the European Union as such, such so that a group of member states say, okay, out of this, uh, of this uh, stalemate, we go, separately on our own agenda, that is indeed quite disruptive because that is actually telling to the rest of the world, uh, starting from your direct interlocutors on the file, uh, there's no European Union position on that. Um, so we act outside of the European Union framework. And this actually puts the role of the European Union and of the High Representative uh, in, uh, uh, in a place close to irrelevance, if I can be very, very candid. Uh, again, I never experienced that directly, but I perfectly realized that in some cases, on some files, we could easily get there. Um, and, uh, um, yeah. and, and then I guess it's a matter of luck and, uh, and a, local, a lot of uh, uh, mediation and facilitation work to try and avoid that. Um, it's the, the work of extinguishing the fire when it's when it's small before it grows bigger. But this is one case. Uh, another case, um, even worse, I would say, is when a group of member states um, decides to start a differentiated process uh, because of uh, open and clear disagreement with the line of the European Union, even if that line was commonly decided by unanimity. Uh, you might have this dynamic. Um, uh, so the, the, the clear intention is that of saying, uh, I, can't, I didn't stop the consensus, but I think differently. Uh, I faced that situation a couple of times in my five years, always related to migration elements, when a group of member states wanted to signal their disagreement with the common position that still they didn't stop, so they didn't prevent the union to have a position, uh, but uh, with the attempt uh, of uh, introducing the uh, practice of uh, uh, adding an asterisk to the council conclusions, 
which was something I hated because I think it, it's uh, it's uh, a declaration of um, yeah uh, of uh, of divisions. Uh, but in some cases, this was the only way in which you could uh, gain the consensus that was allowing you to move forward. In my in my memory, this happened a couple of times in five years. Uh, but uh, you might have dynamics of that kind on, uh, for instance, the Human Rights Council in Geneva, uh, some specific elements on which one member state or another or a group of member states, uh, um, for instance, uh, uh, regional groupings, uh, I think of the Visegrad countries, for instance, uh, make, make a sort of policy statements uh, saying, OK, we don't block, but we disagree. That is really challenging because uh, um, it, it's black and white, and uh, it's uh, it's it's hard then to uh, present the common position of the union as a united front. Um, these are the clear and self-evident, I would say, cases where differentiation uh, is an issue and a problem for a common foreign security policy. Uh, but then, then there are some uh, positive. Uh, clearly positive cases. Uh, I, I've touched um, firsthand a couple of them uh, myself during my mandate. Uh, I'll touch upon uh, two uh, cases that uh, Nicoletta mentioned and that are part of the research, um, where clearly there was an added value. Uh, and uh, uh, the fact that member states were proceeding uh, in, in groups uh, was a way of supporting the European Union role in a specific context. Um, the Normandy format is a clear example of that. Uh, I'd actually started before I became a high representative. I was still a foreign minister. And I know this was extremely controversial in some member states that wanted to be part of, uh, of the club. That is always the tension you need to mediate. Whenever you have a group of member states going in one direction, uh, you always have at least two, or two three, five member states um, that wonder why they're not included. It's the syndrome that Italians know very well because we're always we always feel that the, the smallest of the big ones and the biggest of the small ones. So we always feel borderline. Um, and so in that case, as a minister, I had the pressure of explaining why it was not Italy part of that. Uh, that is uh, always a dynamic, but this this belongs to, uh, to 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 the political dynamics you need to explain. But in that case, in the Normandy format case, um, I. I have to say, I've thought many times that uh, had it happened uh, during my mandate, I would have probably tried uh, to have a European Union role for the mediation uh, on the Ukrainian conflict. But then, uh, if you really look at the dynamic of that conflict and how it started um, and how it developed in the very first days and weeks, you easily realize that uh, one of the parties uh, that needed to be involved in mediation um, or in the effort to mediate, uh, meaning the Russian Federation, was clearly perceiving the European Union as such as part of the problem. And in that case, you have to be humble enough, I believe, to take a step back and realize, can I be a facilitator in the moment when one of the players see me as a, a, an issue, a problem? part of the dynamic of the conflict. And then having two member states in that case at the level of heads of state and government, this is another element that needs always to be considered. Do you have the at the European level, the level of engagement that is necessary to reach the kind of mediation you need in that, in that kind of platform? In that case, it was Hollande and Merkel uh, opening a direct channel with uh, Putin and uh, Poroshenko. Um, would it have been realistic to imagine Tusk playing that role at that stage while the European Union was discussing uh, the imposition of sanctions? Would have it worked? But even on, uh, on very uh, banal, uh, sometimes, you know, foreign policy and, and negotiation, uh, there are elements that are underestimated and that actually play a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of important roles. Uh, the fact that Merkel uh, and Putin could speak uh, the, the same language uh, was a determinant factor. And sometimes this is this kind of personal backgrounds uh, are changing the dynamic around the table. So apart from that, uh, in that moment, I believe that Germany and France played a key role in uh, bridging a gap and uh, trying, trying to put uh, Europe, the European Union, through them 
uh, in a key position to launch uh, a mediation and negotiation process. And that culminated then in the Minsk Agreement, uh, where uh, the mechanism was indeed extremely European, because both Merkel and Hollande were reporting about the negotiations to the European Council every time we had the European Council and in between whenever needed. And in parallel, the two foreign ministers, that time, if I'm not wrong, uh, it was uh, Fabius and Steinmeier reporting constantly to the Foreign Affairs Council. And the Foreign Affairs Council, as you know, meets at least every month. So on a regular basis, very often, uh, the link not only of reporting, but also of mandating somehow, was there, even formally. The Council was constantly adopting conclusions that were somehow indicating the support or the orientation uh, that were the basis for the French and the Germans to negotiate in that process. Um, so, in that case, it was a differentiated process, but with a clear link to the European institutional process. And in that case, it was indeed, uh, I think, uh, a good exercise that allowed the European Union and the other member states to be part of a mediation process in which otherwise it wouldn't have been. Um, even more than that, uh, even, uh, even more positive example of differentiation uh, in, in advancing the EU role is the, uh, is the example of the Iran nuclear deal. In that case, that, that is the apotheosis, I would say, of the differentiation process uh, in terms of uh, uh, support to the role of the European Union globally. Why? Because in that case, you don't only have, and you still have it, uh, the uh, EU member states part of the process. You have that together with some countries that are Security Council members, uh, China, Russia, the United States. But there you have the differentiation process that is actually rooted into a UN Security Council resolution with the definition in the Security Council resolution of the role of the, uh, of the HRVP. The Iran nuclear deal was mediated and negotiated in this way in, uh, if I'm not wrong, 2003, uh, Fisher started this. Uh, so if you're looking at the common red line, the, the fil rouge of all negotiations, you will find one woman that was actually there from the beginning to the end, and that is Elga Schmidt, that was at the time the head of cabinet of uh, Joska Fischer, uh, and that uh, is now the Secretary General of the OEC. Uh, but uh, when it started in 2003, then uh, the UN Security Council adopted unanimously a resolution uh, indicating the format of the process, the purpose of the process, and the EU high representative as the facilitator of the process. I think it's the only time when a UN Security Council resolution indicates as a mediator of a process the, H the HRVP, so uh, an institutional figure of the European Union as such. Uh, so not a person, but uh, a role, a title. Uh, and that uh, obviously was creating a, a system that was giving uh, enough um, what, an institutionalized connection between the Council, uh, the format of the negotiations, and the role of the HRVP that was uh, entitled to brief and be briefed as HRVP. So with the Council, but not only with the Council, with the Parliament, with the Commission, with interlocutors around the world. So in that case, the HRVP added uh, another hat. Um, that of the UN designated mediator for a non proliferation process. Uh, and in that case, it was a very interesting experience for me, uh, a level of complexity that was quite interesting, but also useful the moment when the US left the agreement. Because in that case, the HRVP was not only representing the 28 at the time. It was also speaking on behalf of China, Russia, the United States and Iran. So you always had to uh, move back and forth. When, when are you speaking on behalf of the 28? And that, in most cases, I left to the E3. So uh, you had three member states speaking on behalf of all the 28 member states. And then you have the high representative that uh, is facilitating the entire process 
on behalf of the United Nations, and so whenever he or she speaks, speaks also on behalf of Russia and China and Iran and the United States. And this helped because the moment when the United States left, sorry, I'm going a little bit too deep in the details, but uh, that, that's fascinating also to look back and this dynamic, sometimes you don't realize them when you leave them and then you afterwards you, you, you focus on things. But when the United States left, this was the element that allowed uh, in that moment myself to liaise with Moscow and Beijing and create the connection between Europe and the others to keep the agreement alive. And in that case, that format, with the recognition of the role from the UN Security Council, uh, created a special role for the European Union, a unique role for the European Union. So in that case, that format uh, allowed other member states to participate, um, full unity of the European Union on the Iran file. There was never uh, an element of uh, disconnection uh, and uh, also the possibility to connect to other actors around the world. Then you have other dynamics. So I, I've, uh, I've described the, the, I would say the negative, to simplify the negative or the challenging, uh, the risky uh, areas, uh, uh, the, the positive examples. Then you will have a large gray zone in between. Uh, experiences or attempts or, or processes that uh, um, can be, uh, um, uh, oh, sorry, just let me mention, as, as we are in Finland, even if virtually, uh, let me mention another uh, example of excellent uh, um, uh, differentiation experience, uh, and which is uh, the one of the Nordic countries uh, or the Arctic. Uh, that is the way in which the European Union enters a dynamic that otherwise uh, would be very difficult for, it, for itself and that has never represented any kind of problematic tension or, or, or issue. Uh, that, but then you have a, a, a grey zone uh, where you can uh, well, you can define the process useful and, and positive, but you also constantly have to monitor the challenges and try to avoid that they develop into a, a negative reaction. Um, I can give examples around uh, the Balkans, for instance, when you have uh, uh, the uh, so-called Berlin process uh, to support uh, the, uh, the uh, Western Balkan perspectives uh, towards European Union accession, uh, and that sometimes turned into, uh, yeah, well, so it, it was definitely and is definitely useful to support a common foreign policy priority for the Union, but then you sometimes had issues, serious issues even, why some are in and what some are not, uh, what are the others allowed to interact in which way. So a, a sort of, yeah, uh, gray zone of, uh, of uh, um, potentials and, and challenges, let's put it this way, or contradictory messages that sometimes could come. Uh, in, in Italian, we would say uh, salti in avanti, uh, uh, moves of one or more member states uh, that were definitely anticipating positions that the others were not sharing, or on the contrary, other member states using those formats to slow down a process that others were supporting. So. In some cases, obviously, again, you have an instrument that can be used um, in one way or another, and you have to monitor how this is done and keep control or to try to keep control from Brussels of dynamics that go on at capital levels. Or uh, in other cases, you just need, um, again, let me use an Italian expression, Nicoletta, I've always struggled to translate it in English, fare di necessità virtù. Uh, make out of uh, a necessity a virtue. Uh, you are facing a situation, you know you're not going to stop it, and then you try to channel it towards something conducive to something positive. Um, I guess this is a realistic approach. Sometimes you have that kind of dynamics. For instance, we have had that kind of dynamics on Libya quite a lot, where you had uh, the Paris conference, uh, you had uh, uh, another one in Italy, then you had another one in Berlin, and you had groupings of countries uh, doing something, always formally in line with the European Union common position, and that was the main point. Uh, but in reality, in fact, showing, sh showcasing an element of potential competition among member states, even if not clearly and, and openly 
stated in that way. Uh, so there you have a surface of um, common line. Uh, so the initiative is meant to help the common line, but then the choice of interlocutors, the timing of events clearly show that the dynamic is there to position the country and not the union uh, as such uh, on the front line. And there you have to indeed try to make sure that whatever comes out, normally not much, but whatever comes out of these initiatives is in line with the common line of the 28th at my time, 27 today, uh, and that you fine tune and you coordinate, you, you constantly create links between the, the institutional place, the Foreign Affairs Council or the European Council in some cases, depending on the level of implication, and the initiative of groups of member states. Um, that is the main exercise to, to do, and always also um, banal, again, very basic, uh, the need to put yourself in the picture, sometimes literally. Uh, sometimes you have to put the high representative in the family photo. Now, in, now in the COVID times, this is not an issue anymore because we don't have family photos anymore. Uh, but uh, um, to, to, to make it visible that the European Union is there. And so even if some member states are not there sitting around that table, they are through the high representative. And that works only if then you report back to the Foreign Affairs Council and you bring at that table what the Foreign Affairs Council has indicated as a, as a common policy. Uh, so in those cases, it can be useful, but it can also be dangerous. And it can be also useful to fill in a gap that otherwise other countries, non-European countries, would uh, use. That was the case, for instance, on the Syria uh, International Support Group. Uh, where we had uh, several member states, if I'm not wrong, many member states, at a certain moment we had seven or eight of them, uh, so definitely quite many, uh, and they were all expressing the same line. Uh, so fr from, uh, from a UN point of view, it might have been questionable what was the added value of having, of having eight member states of the European Union expressing the same, exactly the same position, uh, which was happening and that was good. But then on the other side, if you looked at the composition around the table, you realize that from a negotiating point of view, it was useful to have eight voices expressing that same position because that was balancing other voices that were arguing in another direction. And so you, you play the, the member states in that case of the United Nations being on a coordinated line of the European Union to counterbalance a position that was different and expressed by other member states of the UN. And this is true also in other UN processes, if you think of uh, uh, yeah, the Middle East peace process or uh, um, some, uh, um, some dynamics on the Venezuela conflict. We, we could discuss of many, other, uh, of many other things. So in that case, you can actually use small groups of member states of the European Union having exactly the same line, which is the European Union line, to advance a certain position in a global context, playing with numbers. Uh, which is a useful thing because you advance the EU line uh, in a much more effective manner. Uh, so I'm sorry, I've, I think I've been even too long, uh, but uh, and for sure I've uh, uh, I've uh, not touched upon all the possible examples uh, uh, we could have touched upon. I didn't mention anything on defence, but I'm happy to uh, come back to that point uh, later on, uh, because I think that this is actually a completely different um, um, picture, a completely different uh, kind of, of experience, because there you have actually a, a treaty uh, uh, hook, uh, which is not the case in the foreign policy uh, differentiation processes. There you don't have, uh, well, um, no, on, on foreign policy you don't have hooks in, in the treaty for differentiation actually. On defense you have many of them. Uh, you have, uh, obviously, you had the possibility of activating PESCO, which we did, and uh, that was probably the single thing on which I was more uh, more proud of, probably even more than the Iran deal, well, the, the two together, uh, but the, the work on defense uh, for me was really the, 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 the yeah, the element of, uh, of pride. Uh, but you also have other articles that have never been used. Uh, now, I don't remember exactly, I think it was... I'll check the number um, of the article of the treaty, but for instance, there is the possibility for member states to act together in a military operation uh, with, without uh, the framework of a Euro EU military operation, but on a mandate given by the Foreign Affairs Council. 
This was never done before. I always thought that this could have been used in certain cases because that is a classical and I think extremely advanced case of dif positive differentiation uh, tools because there you have a recognition in the treaty and institutionalized with the link to the Foreign Affairs Council, a mandate given by unanimity and a group of member states operating militarily and reporting back to the Council. Uh, all in an institutional framework, which would be, I think, uh, something to, 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 to try to use. Uh, that would have been my next step on, on the work on defence. So I think that differentiation on defence is, a, is a somehow different because it has many more uh, elements of institutional framework uh, that uh, reduce the risk of misinterpretation or the risk of, uh, um, of uh, member states' uh, um, uh, elements of jealousy or sense of being left uh, behind or outside of circles. Uh, I would say that this is, last word, this is the main risk behind this kind of dynamics. Uh, and it's not uh, an operational risk, it's not a political risk, it's even a psychological risk, if I can use this uh, reference. The risk of introducing the idea that you might have important member states and less important member states. This is the risk, the main risk of the differentiation process, um, the, the club of the big ones uh, that then evolves over time. Uh, but this is the main point because this introduces elements of frictions that then apply also to other dynamics that have nothing to do with the topic itself. Uh, and that was the risk of the Normandy format, I believe, uh, a risk that, for instance, Poland felt very strongly. Why not us? Um, and indeed, there are elements of reality in this sense, because differentiation processes normally are self-determined. Uh, and so it's the member states themselves that define who is in and who is not. And this lack of transparency in the build-up of most of these processes is indeed introducing an element of, um, how could I say, uh, mistrust, sus suspect, uh, why are we? Why are you keeping me out? And this is a psychological element that stays deep in the minds and in the souls of public opinions, uh, and creates problems that maybe are not problems related to the foreign policy issue as such that you're tackling at that moment, and maybe you, it can come up six months later or one year later on a completely different file. Uh, on, on an economic file or on an internal market file. And, and the roots of that maybe have to be seen in that element of self-perceived exclusion that one member state or another might have felt. Sorry for being so long, but uh, uh, the, the topic is fascinating. I'm looking very much forward to, uh, to listening to uh, the conversation and interacting with you further on. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Federica Moccherini, uh, for your very insightful um, remarks and analysis about differentiation. I have to say that the topic is very fascinating, but it was also very fascinating to listen to your experience and, and the kind of the pragmatic and practical side of, of differentiation uh, during your term as the High Representative Vice President. Thank you very much for your time and devotion, and, and, and I'm really looking forward to hear uh, a bit of more your uh, comments uh, after the panel discussion where we are now moving. Thank you also, Nicoletta, for your kind words in the beginning and this uh, a deepening uh, north-south collaboration between our institutes, institutes, but also more broadly in the framework of this EU ID network uh, and with the excellent researchers uh, we've been working for a number of months already. And now it's time to move uh, onto our panel discussion, and I'm 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 uh, very uh, happy to 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 note that there are excellent scholars with us who've been looking at many of the elements that were already mentioned by Mogherini in the keynote uh, intervention, and uh, the idea of this panel is to give them a chance to reflect uh, uh, what was said in the keynote, but also what they have found out in their research related to the different uh, uh, features and different policy portfolios, uh, which relates to the differentiated integration and differentiation more broadly in EU's foreign and security uh, policy. 
The first one on my list is uh, Eduard Soler Ilecha, and he is a senior research fellow uh, at Barcelona Center for International Affairs, uh, 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 often known also as CDOP, the acronym. Uh, uh, very happy that you are with us here today as well. And your team has uh, focused on both the formal and informal mechanisms of differentiation within the uh, uh, common foreign and security uh, policy. And as was mentioned by Mogherini, uh, they seem to be more extensive in the field of defense, but there are some hooks also uh, formal ones, treaty-based in the, in the common foreign and security policy. And I think your observation was that they have not been used. I mean, here, for instance, the enhanced cooperation has not been uh, uh, put in use. But instead, there are these informal forms of cooperation, small groups collaborating very actively on different uh, uh, files of EU foreign policy. And one of the case studies that you looked into relates to the Arab-Israeli conflict and the Middle East peace process, which is, of course, a very topical matter also in light of this week's elections uh, in Israel. Also, if you look at the recent uh, uh, regional dynamics, as well as uh, uh, what is expected from the new US administration, in office. So could you elaborate on this uh, file uh, and in particular try to answer the question why it has been more difficult uh, for the EU member states to agree on, issue, agree on issues related to the Arab-Israeli conflict and the peace process and which alternative pathways can be potentially explored for the EU to remain a relevant actor in this file. Thanks so much. And I think, yes, I can answer to that question. And in fact, I think it links well with what we have heard from Federica Mogherini. This is a case also where we are getting closer, as Federica Mogherini said, to the worst case scenario, that is where uh, different actors in that sense, member states alone, lonely member states or in groups also find incentives and are giving incentives by other actors, be it regional actors like Israel, for instance, or global ones like the US during the Trump administration to obstruct uh, commonly agreed decisions at the level of the European Union. And this would be the fundamental reason about why uh, it is so difficult to agree on issues related to the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict and the Middle East peace process right now, which is because there are actors that find it useful and also because there are external actors that are promoting this kind of internal developments within uh, the uh, European uh, Union. And if it was another case, perhaps it, not, it would not be that problematic. But the Arab-Israeli conflict and the Middle East peace process has been kind of a litmus test since the very beginning, since the 1970s, with the development of the European political cooperation of the level of ambition, of uh, cohesion, and even actorness of the European Union at the global stage. So wherever happens uh, in, in this field uh, matters not only for the Arab-Israeli conflict and for the EU's role in this hotspot, but also about its image and credibility uh, globally. Here, so I said, I mean, the Europeans have always been divided. That's not a novelty from the very beginning, but they were able traditionally to find not only a common ground, but a meaningful one. And uh, there was like very important moments like the Venice Declaration, where not only the EU was relevant, but was also able to act autonomously from the United States in a still a context of the Cold War uh, and being visionary, if you allow me, in the way the EU would put some issues on the agenda. So I said the EU has mattered in this field and now the obstructions do not allow the EU to matter as much as uh, it did. In this context in which we have very different views, in which we have actors, member states that have incentives to obstruct and are being rewarded uh, uh, for those obstructions, we have three options. The first one, which was being discussed in 2012, I remember when there was the discussion, I was observing that as a researcher of the Palestinian state in the UN, was to us abstaining in block. 
so assuming that we were irrelevant in a way. That's a possibility. You are united in your irrelevance. And in that sense, I very much agree with what Federica Mogherini has said. Better to have different but meaningful voices than just to be silent on relevant issues. Then we go, and that was what finally agreed. Huh? Uh, member states decided to vote differently, and uh, at least European member states had a policy on such an important issue. A second option is to entrust these uh, lead groups, and there have been of very different kinds, the quint, the like-minded, uh, either to incubate European positions and then try to upload it or at least have a European voice when there is none and assuming the idea that we may be divided but that there is a significant number of European states uh, eventually also in cooperation with the European institutions that can have their voice being their voice heard. And the third option is try to be creative what, with what we have. As you have said, enhanced uh, cooperation on this has not been possible. And I think that very much the, is related to the fact that there are countries that are willing to obstruct, <laughs> so that they are being rewarded, so that they will impede this from happening, because their goal is that the EU does not have a position, not to be part, not uh, avoiding to be part of that position, but to obstruct that, that position. So this leaves us with some space of creativity. And this space of creativity is where uh, high representatives have had to recall previous statements and try to reinterpret in light of uh, unfolding events. This has some limits. There will be a moment where this is uh, no longer possible or when you could have these lead groups acting as a lead group, but in close cooperation and making it very visible with the high representative or with the uh, special representatives uh, in the in the Middle East. That's the other option. There has been also another uh, test that has been tested by the Finnish presidency of the European Union, which was uh, speaking on behalf of 27 members, omitting that there were 28 members at that point. That was in the framework of the UN. You could do it, but obviously the one that feels uh, let's say, uh, um, ignore, as Federica Mogherini said, I mean, at some point it will also have the temptation to make very visible that uh, their level of, of angriness. So to conclude and to respond to our overall question, yes, unity is better, but not if unity means irrelevance. So in that sense, differentiations, I don't know whether it makes Europe stronger, but at least it means it makes Europeans relevant. Mm? And definitely it's a path to be explored when it comes to the Middle East peace process. Something has been tested and probably more could be done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eduard, uh, of this analysis and your comments. And now I have Marco Citti on my, on my list, uh, a senior research fellow here at FIA. And you have uh, focused with your colleague uh, precisely on the lead groups, which were elaborated quite extensively by the by Mogherini and in the keynote. And uh, I guess you have something to say on the Normandy format, which you contributed uh, to the paper. Please, Marco, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Juha, and thanks for the excellent uh, speeches so far. Um, indeed, uh, we heard in the keynote that having many voices is an asset, and certainly the voices of uh, the so-called big three uh, until recently, uh, Germany, France and the United Kingdom, were especially essential for foreign policy. And uh, the Franco-German duo in particular, if we look at, uh, at the Normandy uh, format. So uh, in our paper, which um, in a way provides or is based on um, uh, national primary sources, we interviewed uh, high ranking national officials uh, uh, that were closely involved in the Normandy uh, four negotiations. So we um, um, ironically or maybe not so ironically, but we, we came to very similar uh, uh, um, observations as the ones we heard from uh, Federica Mogherini uh, earlier today. 
Uh, and a key question was assessing effectiveness. Um, so on the one hand, we can say that the Franco-German duo did not uh, uh, manage to resolve the conflict uh, through the Normandy format. But then again, it also lacked the power assets uh, to do so. Um, and we can um, see what they achieved, a uh, weak but working ceasefire, as uh, a considerable uh, uh, achievement, especially if we also keep into account that other actors, uh, um, if we think about the OSCE-led mediation in 2014, or also US initiatives, uh, fail to achieve uh, de-escalation. Uh, of course, many factors uh, come into play. The military uh, situation in February 2015 might have been, uh, um, might have made things a bit easier uh, to, to achieve a stalemate at that point rather than earlier on. Uh, nonetheless, we should recognize that uh, the Franco-German duo uh, played an important role and achieved some results. And then, um, so the question is, how were they able to do so and why? Um, so why was it uh, France and Germany uh, rather than other member states? So that maybe I can add something also to what was stated earlier on. Uh, well, um, in our interviews, we heard that the chemistry that uh, was created in these uh, uh, negotiations was very important. And after this chemistry was achieved, it was difficult to include additional uh, players because there was a risk of endangering uh, the, 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 the chemistry itself. Um, it was also very important that, that uh, German and French uh, representatives were um, were, were able to talk uh, to all sides and uh, that Germany and France have a solid bilateral tradition uh, of relations with Russia, which they put at the service of European foreign policy. Let's just think about the German Ostpolitik uh, towards, uh, towards uh, Russia. Also, it was essential that they all uh, had external recognition. Uh, recognition from the Russian side was very important. Um, um, we often heard in the interviews that Russia would only talk to European powers, so to the major European uh, uh, players, uh, France and Germany again. Uh, but uh, Germany and France also enjoyed uh, trust of the Ukrainian side. And also, uh, as long as Obama was US president, there was close coordination uh, uh, with the United States. So uh, this was very important. And uh, other member states, uh, Poland was mentioned earlier on, did not fulfill all these uh, aspects. Uh, we might remember that Poland was initially involved uh, at an early stage uh, through the Weimar uh, Triangle format in February 2014, when uh, then uh, Foreign Minister uh, Radek Sikorski uh, traveled with his German and French colleagues to, uh, to Kiev. However, then several factors, domestic factors in Poland, the change of government, and also questions of external recognition played a role. Uh, for example, uh, the Russian side was not too keen uh, on, on having uh, Poland there. Uh, and frankly, Ukraine also had uh, several uh, issues with the Polish government later on uh, over historical issues. Um, so um, I, I conclude maybe my points on the Normandy format by stressing that while this is an imperfect format and it did not achieve uh, uh, a resolution of the conflict, we should also remember that sustained de-escalation uh, only occurred uh, with Minsk II and when uh, Merkel and Hollande uh, took center stage in the negotiations and constantly coordinated uh, with European institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco, for your analysis, adding to the analysis we heard already earlier. And I think we can get back to the uh, topic as well, maybe if we have time for the second round and also discuss a little bit about the criticisms that there has been towards uh, towards uh, the role of the lead groups played in EU foreign policy. But now I would like to uh, introduce another topic which we haven't actually discussed here uh, today which is also part of the research that we've been uh, uh, conducting uh, under this project. And this is actually this is the external uh, differentiation, uh, namely in the fields of the CFSB and uh, CSD, CSDB. And there has been a paper published today uh, uh, on this very topic. 
uh, how does EU work with its neighboring partner countries in differentiated manner? And does this help the EU to achieve its goals in foreign and security uh, policy? So we have here uh, uh, Luigi uh, Scassieri with us from the Center for European Reform, and you're one of the uh, key authors of this paper. So what is uh, your assessment? What did your research show about the role of differentiated partnerships with neighboring countries in, teams of, in terms of EU's foreign policy and security policy? Do they make the EU more effective actor in its neighborhoods? or globally. Well, uh, thank you, Joa, and uh, thank you um, to those who have presented already. So, yes, as you mentioned in our um, research, we looked at partnerships and specifically at, um, at the way the EU works with uh, countries in its neighbourhood. So we looked at the accession candidates, we looked at uh, NATO, uh, non-EU non NATO allies, mainly Norway and the UK. And then we looked at some members of the Eastern Partnership, uh, those that have association agreements with the EU, so Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine. And uh, there is no single cooperation model, but um, the EU cooperates with partners in different ways and to different degrees, uh, even though actually the formal arrangements tend to be relatively similar for many of them. Um, but just to pick two examples, some like Norway, enjoys a very close partnership with the EU, whereas others, like the UK, um, you know, has, has so far sought to avoid any uh, kind of formal uh, linkage to the EU in the field of foreign policy. In terms of you know, whether this kind of differentiation helps the EU, uh, we found that the EU does benefit in several ways from, uh, from cooperating with its partners. First of all, through uh, consultation, which takes place in a range of formats depending on the partner and ensures that, um, that there's a, a dialogue that partners feel heard and also contributes to uh, strengthening bilateral relations with the EU. But at the same time, by consulting and coordinating with its partners, the EU also maximizes the chances that they will be aligned with its foreign policy. Um, and indeed, this provides added diplomatic weight for the EU's initiatives, to its statements, also in international organizations when countries might align with the EU. And, and in the field of security and defense, uh, many of the, of the countries that we, uh, that we studied actually made uh, significant contributions to uh, CSDP uh, operations, especially, uh, especially Turkey which was one of the largest contributors overall. And uh, uh, of course, third country participation to, um, to EU operations is not only important in terms of the assets that they can contribute, but they can also add to an operation's legitimacy and, uh, and also to its visibility. Mm, partners have also contributed troops to, uh, to EU battle groups, although of course, battle groups themselves have never, uh, have never been used. And some partners uh, have agreements to cooperate with the, with the European Defence Agency, participating in, uh, in training projects, but also in capability development projects. And uh, uh, we also talked about uh, permanent structured cooperation. And here, uh, partners can be invited to participate in, uh, in PESCO projects with Norway, for example, having requested to join the project on, on military mobility. And finally, some of the EU's partners, uh, particularly the members of the European Economic Area, are also formally associated to the European Defence Fund uh, by virtue of their uh, membership of the single market through the EEA. Through the EEA. And uh, this means that their defence industries will, uh, will potentially be able to make a significant contribution to uh, developing the, the military capabilities that Europe needs. Um, for partners themselves, uh, of course, uh, this is about uh, trying to influence the EU, strengthening bilateral relations, but um, there are some who feel the EU maybe doesn't always uh, consult quite as frequently as they would like or uh, talk about the topics that they, would, uh, that they would like to discuss. So some have uh, tried to uh, 
advance ideas for how these partnerships might be deepened, and the EU is considering these ideas a bit. I'll perhaps talk about this angle later. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Luigi. Uh, we have also uh, uh, Professor Senem Aydin Dusik with us here today, and you also contributed to the paper uh, uh, which has been published today, and, 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 and the kind of the key messages already uh, uh, are conveyed by Luigi. Uh, uh, your field of field of expertise is, of course, the e uh, EU-Turkey relationship, and uh, and it would be interesting to hear your assessment on. How is external differentiation in EU's relationships viewed in Turkey? And are there any incentives for EU-Turkey uh, foreign and security po policy cooperation given the current tensions, uh, Turkey being one of the key topics of this week's European Council meeting later on? Thank you very much, Yuha. Um, it's it's very nice to be here and this company. I've enjoyed very much uh, the speeches before me as well. Um, now, yes, I am going to mention Turkey, as you said, but before that, I think it's impossible to talk about EU-Turkey relations or foreign policy cooperation or cooperation in other fields without talking about EU and EU foreign policy. And the shape of EU foreign policy, which we have and which we want to see, so I'd like to begin discussing that a little bit, if possible, and then make an intervention there uh, with respect to uh, the Eastern Mediterranean and the Turkish question as well. Now, on the one hand, of course, when we talk about cooperation with third countries, uh, we, I mean, that goes together with this sort of new vision of a more geopolitical Europe, right? We see that in the um, official speeches. We see that everywhere in the text. Uh, and it's all about defining this geopolitical Europe, because much of third party cooperation, I think, also hinges on how we define this. What do we mean by geopolitics here? Do we mean geopolitics in the sense that countries like Russia or Turkey use it? Is that the kind of EU foreign policy that Europe wants to espouse? Or is it something that also looks at domestic politics, values, principles as well, which is not just a normative issue, but which is also an issue uh, that the interest based also to some extent, because you need also those to have sustainable foreign policy cooperation. As we've also found in our paper that Luigi also mentioned, that the more you have value or political wise convergence between third countries and the European Union, the more beneficial cooperation schemes that you have in both the formal and all the, also the informal sense of the term. Now, how do we answer this, uh, this question? That is, how much can you decouple foreign policy issues from domestic policies? in forging EU foreign policy, that is decoupling domestic and foreign policies in the third countries which the European Union is trying to engage with or wishes to engage with on certain um, issues. I think this is an important question and it's an intervention on how we define Europe as well and the future of Europe, that is. I think we also need to approach this question um, in on the basis of two uh, more recent developments. One, of course, uh, a new administration in the United States um, and its approach to uh, issues such as international democracy support and multilateralism. So they seem to be supporting multilateralism together with democracy. So that seems to be the, on the agenda, although it's too early to say how they're going to go about practicing what they preach. And the second thing I, I think we need to consider in responding to this question is the rise of autocratic movements within Europe and governments, such as in places like Hungary and Poland. This is also important because often these uh, anti-democratic movements or governments are looking for alliances beyond European borders. And sometimes those third countries like Turkey, who are turning into autocracies inside, but also seeking foreign policy cooperation along with conflict outside with the European Union. So this is not just a foreign policy issue. I think for Europe, these are very much domestic matters that we would have to uh, keep into consideration as well. Now, from this perspective, I think, you know, just like, you know, United States talks about uh, international democracy as a national security issue in its recent uh, Biden's national security document, um, I think in the case of the European Union as well, this should perhaps be seen as a larger matter of European security, especially regarding its relationship with the neighborhood. 
Now, here comes the Eastern Mediterranean question, Johan, that you were asking at the very beginning. Now, I'm going to cut the story short. Perhaps we can dig, in, dig deeper into that in the Q&A if there are any of you who are interested. But I think the problem here and in relation to what I've just mentioned at the beginning is this. What the Turkish government has been playing into is something along the lines of I'm going to try to play the rules of the game and decline ten shikri's tension in the Eastern Mediterranean and elsewhere. But in doing that, I'm also going to amp up and increase oppression at home and basically try to sell this decoupling both to the United States and Europe as much as possible. So have a free hand domestically, whereas making some concessions or moves or new maneuvers internationally, you know, with countries like Egypt, but also, you know, with the European Union as well. Now, here is the thing. How the European Union will approach this decoupling is, I think, is of crucial importance with respect to how it will act externally, be, you know, with and beyond Turkey, how it will define its foreign policy and how sustainable these third country foreign policy cooperation will ultimately be. My hunch is that um, the European Union for now, because we've all seen uh, the recent uh, report of the high representative, it was, I think, published or announced yesterday, uh, it was submitted to the European Council meeting that will be held later this week. Um, and there, I mean, obviously, it's a foreign policy report, it comes from that institution within the EU. So you wouldn't expect it to talk too much about whatever is happening within Turkey. That's what you're accustomed from progress reports, regular reports from the Commission. But still, the impression that uh, the Turkish government is getting, at least, and you know, you know uh, from within, is that Europe will be fine to cooperate with Turkey on issues regarding, you know, modernization of a customs union, perhaps visas, people-to-people -people contacts, high levels of political dialogue, as long as Turkey steps, you know, cools down the tension in the Eastern Mediterranean and works with Europe on key issues such as migration. That seems to be the message. So that text itself also is a text about, you know, foreign policy priorities and cooperation with only like a word about democracy or domestic governance. That seems to at least give the impression that the European Union might ultimately be going to a decoupling of Turkey's domestic governance and a foreign policy cooperation, at least when it concerns relations with Turkey. And I think that this is not, um, these are not very healthy grounds for sustainable cooperation. Um, in the sense that I think it is very, very difficult to completely decouple the domestic from external uh, when you look at these autocracies like the Erdogan government, where um, foreign policy is often instrumentalized for domestic means, which means that you can have bouts of aggression in Eastern Mediterranean or elsewhere. That can be any moment. Um, again, uh, issues like migration, but other matters as well, would, will continue to be leveraged whenever things go rough between the two sides. So there is no sustainability to that too. And of course, if Europe really fears migration, and if that seems to be the number one priority, then this kind of approach will not put an end to uh, further migration pressures, not from Syria and the southern neighborhood, but from Turkey itself in the coming years, which has already begun. So that is going to be, I think, an issue for the future as well as the EU decouples that uh, more and more. So I think this, this is a significant matter. And I think you only need to look at, for instance, how in the recent days when Turkey abolished, you know, withdrew from the Istanbul Convention on Women's Rights on uh, Friday evening, and then suddenly you hear voices from Hungary and Poland that, you know, celebrating the Turkish government and how they're standing by their brothers. So, you know, just proves my first point that automatically these issues are picked up within the EU as well and damages the internal coherence, not just in foreign policy, but value wise and domestic politics, too, which I think makes, you know, leads me to conclude that we should really discuss how this decoupling will happen. Is it happening and will it really work and what can be the unintended, perhaps, consequences of that? I think these are all uh, food for thought that we should be discussing. Yes, and I think I'm going to stop it there. You have. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Sen, and, and, and this is a very interesting uh, topic and discussion in terms of if we move from differentiation to di discussing decoupling. I think uh, that's something what we need to think about also within our work package uh, uh, a little bit more in the future. But now we still have one paper uh, author left with us, and that's Sven Bishop, and the team is what also Mogherini addressed uh, uh, in the latter part of her keynote, and that's the uh, PESCO and uh, and the defense uh, cooperation or integration, if you if you like. And Sven, you have been working extensively on this topic and also contributed a paper. And, and as it was mentioned, the, uh, the so-called sleeping beauty of the Lisbon Treaty was uh, made awake uh, in 2017 uh, with the launch of the PESCO. And this is, of course, an interesting uh, uh, form of differentiated integration, uh, treaty-based differentiated integration, where 25 out of the current 27 member states uh, participates in this rather far-reaching uh, scene. Some could argue that there is also differentiation within differentiation because uh, uh, the, the modular approach uh, adopted by PESCO enabling also smaller groups within PESCO to collaborate. But PESCO has been has been with us now uh, some three years. So what is your assessment of it? Is it likely to be a game changer with regard to the challenges related to European defence? This is the topic that you address also in your paper. Sven, please. Thank you, Juha. And um, apologies beforehand if there might be some um, background noise, because I think my next door neighbour uh, has become so isolated by the lockdown that she's getting all kinds of works done in her apartment just so that she could meet somebody. But it seems to be endless, even though the apartment is quite small. I know it is quite small because it's the same size as mine. Uh, anyway, indeed, PESCO was the sleeping beauty. Um, we tried to awaken it in 2010, the year after uh, the Lisbon Treaty entered into force. Belgium had the presidency in the second half of the year then. And I had the chance to be closely involved. And we had, of course, brilliant ideas on how to do that. Uh, and then we realized that most other member states were thinking, well, should we do that? Uh, and in the end, uh, the beauty was not yet awakened. And that finally happened in 2017 uh, on Federica Mongherini's watch, obviously. And I think greatly pushed by uh, France and Germany, uh, then together with, with Italy and, and Spain. Um, it is, as you say, you are an example of differentiation in a way, because in the end, uh, 25 out of 27 uh, are taken part. Uh, unfortunately, my assessment is relatively bleak. I think it is a great instrument with, with enormous potential. We're just not using it. Um, I sometimes say we're using it the way I use my smartphone. Um, you know, there are always first um, uh, adopters, people who are the first to rush to, get, to adopt new technology. I'm the opposite. I'm the last one. And my husband kept telling, telling me that I needed a smartphone and, and I, I postponed and postponed until he just bought me one. So now I have one. So what I do with it, well, I'm an old fashioned guy, so I actually still make phone calls with a phone. And if there's free Wi-Fi, I listen to my emails with it. I, I read my emails with it. And that's it. So I use maybe, I don't know, 1% of the menu that my smartphone offers. And that is, I think, unfortunately, what, what member states so far are doing with PESCO. What are we doing with PESCO? We're doing um, some, pro some projects to, to design and build and procure new pieces of equipment, 47 so far. All of these are useful, but almost none of these are important. I think two or three of them are important, such as military mobility or the Eurodrone project. All the others, if, if we would do them, well, if, if all 47 would be finished tomorrow, we would still be as dependent on the Americans to project our forces as we as we are today. Because the, the big projects to fill the, the key shortfalls that we have, especially strategic enablers, they are missing because member states don't propose them. And even the prospect, the projects that we have when they deliver, what will we do with the equipment? Well, the equipment will be fragmented, will be redistributed across all the individual national armed forces. And so that is a very limited use of PESCO. In a way, that is using PESCO as if it were the light version of the European Defence Fund. Because indeed, for what we're doing now, you would not actually need PESCO. You could also do it 
do it without it, also just through the European Defence Agency. Whereas PESCO, when it was adopted, is so much more ambitious. PESCO says that uh, 25 commit uh, not just to do joint procurement, it's an important part of it, but also to align their defence planning, to harmonise their requirements and equipment, um, to invest in the European defence industry, to make available strategically deployable formations with the aim of arriving in the end at a comprehensive full spectrum force package. The way I read that, um, permanent structured cooperation actually means integration. What we now have is cooperation between national armed forces. What PESCO envisages, in my view, is integration, a permanent anchoring of national armed forces in, in, in permanent multinational structures. Then I think we could we could really make the quantum leap that we uh, that we need to become uh, to become a lot more um, a lot more effective. Um, so all of that is possible, but it's not happening for the moment. We had a strategic review of PESCO last year, um, but unfortunately that didn't change much. Nothing was decided really, uh, so the PESCO's course hasn't been altered. However, we got a new chance because. Now the um, EU has decided to adopt a so-called strategic compass. You could say a strategy for the CSDP under the global strategy. Uh, and, and we could possibly, I think, pick up uh, where we left off last year and do now in the framework of this compass what we should have done in the, in the PESCO strategic review. Um, it requires, however, uh, and I'll end on that so that there is some time left for, for debate still in, the, in this session, um, it requires, however, in a way that we change the, the culture of, of CSDP, because I think for differentiation to work, um, two things are necessary. One, if you create a, a, another group, a, a, a smaller group, even though in this case it's not much smaller than the full membership, um, there's no point if the small group is as intergovernmental as the complete group. Huh? In all the successful small groups, they have done, they, they went from the beginning for a very integrated approach, for a supranational approach. As this is not the case in PESCO. Um, if you disagree with 27, you're likely also to disagree with 25. But the other thing is cultural, and it's in a way more difficult. Um, somehow the culture has grown in CSDP that it's perfectly acceptable to come to Brussels, to sign up to all kinds of commitments in the full knowledge that you have no intention whatsoever of living up to those commitments. And so time and again, member states say, we're going to integrate our armed forces. Uh, we are not make announcements with great fanfare. Um, and then we go home and, and we don't do it. And that is totally opposite to the dynamic or the culture in all the other policy areas, of course, of, of, of the European Union. But unfortunately, in defense, uh, it is still a fact. So we can only hope that our interests uh, would finally push us to do what we've been saying now for 20 years since the creation of ESDP in 1999 that we would do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sven. And as you mentioned, time is uh, 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 moving on very quickly. And now I would like to ask whether Federica Mocherini would like to come back and, and provide us your views or responses to the outcomes presented stemming from the research done in the work package. Please. Well, it has been extremely interesting to listen to that uh, and uh, um, it would take uh, probably a little bit more than the time we have uh, to react to every single uh, presentation and paper. So I would maybe just uh, uh, underline a couple of points uh, and, and limit myself to that. Um, one is, uh, um, is what Edward mentioned uh, uh, in the beginning. Uh, it resonated so much um, with what I constantly uh, found I was actually doing when I was in office, um, which was what I labeled uh, internally only, and never used this publicly, as a creative diplomacy. Uh, so many cases in which uh, uh, you have a situation where you realize that you do not have the conditions to really solve an issue, uh, but you realize that you can do something to prevent the worst from happening, which is already uh, a good result in certain cases. And that was exactly what happened uh, on uh, what, what uh, Marco elaborated uh, on, uh, exactly what happened uh, with the MISC uh, agreement. Uh, we stopped the escalation uh, uh, and we prevented uh, um, this to, to become even worse than 
it was, uh, in particular in February 2015. And I say we because uh, that case was exactly um, as it described a process where, uh, first of all, you had uh, not only all the elements you mentioned, Marco, but also another fundamental element, the combination of having both the presidential level, so presidents and chancellor in that case, and the foreign ministers level connecting in that kind of chemistry you mentioned. And so you could alternate the top level negotiations with the ministerial negotiations in a very um, in, in a very fruitful manner, but always linked linked with, with uh, uh, in that case, the high representative or the president of the council. So um, that dynamic word, but that was um, that was a, a case of a creative approach for sure. Um, but so many other cases in which, uh, yes, you have to define, and I guess it is even more so the case now, you have to define uh, in the lack of traditional patterns uh, for mediation, negotiation, or or dim diplomatic processes, what can what kind of spaces you can create, which is a sort of magician work. Uh, that was the case on the Venezuelan crisis when we established the the, the contact group, uh, and it, sometimes you realize that. Uh, uh, the lack of a process is a problem in itself, even if you know that the process is not going to be conducive to an immediate solution. Um, if you understand what I mean, the absence of any uh, track of dialogue or any track of negotiation, uh, because different other institutions are not able to or are not interested uh, in opening a process or a space, um, and that lack of, of process represents in itself a deteriorating aspect or um, element in the conflict or the crisis itself. And so sometimes you, set, you try to set up uh, a process and to open a space, even if you know that the results of that would be limited, because you know that not having that in place would be conducive to a worsening situation. Uh, so that that is yeah again and sometimes even a statement can make the trick, <laughs> uh, and indeed uh, uh, you refer to um, to to some uh, of these tricks of uh, repeating statements that were adopted uh, years before. And yes, that is part of the creative diplomacy, uh, and and I think it, there is a validity in that uh, because uh, uh, yes, in the absence of renewed decisions, the old ones stay, so uh, you, they can still represent the 28 at the time or the 27 now. So indeed, that field of of uh, creative application of uh, uh, of whatever could work or could at least help not damaging further the situation is indeed, I think. Um, a very um, a field where differentiation applies, and then maybe I would comment on uh, um, on on uh, uh, the issue of the external uh, differentiation. Um, that is a field where I believe differentiation is vital. It's not just useful or positive; it's literally vital, because every single partner uh, has a completely different dynamic. Domestically, uh, as Sanem mentioned uh, here, uh, domestic politics, both in the partner country and inside the European Union countries, determine the agenda much more than the partnership itself. That's clear, uh, and um, has a different interest. Now, some mention uh, this, uh, especially on the Eastern Partnership, but also on the on the Mediterranean. Um, some mention it as a um, as a level of ambition. Uh, I would never define it this way because I think uh, you can be extremely ambitious uh, on the kind of partnership, but be interested in a different kind of partnership. Um, and and uh, this is rooted in economic interests, in geopolitical interests, sometimes in history. Uh, and I believe that the key uh, to success in the European partnerships with third countries is exactly that capacity that sometimes we have and some other times we have a little bit less to under, to listen first, to un listen, understand and meet the expectations and the interests of the others uh, on their field uh, and use all the space that opens up. Uh, I, I give you an example, the agreement, well, the agreement signed with Armenia and Azerbaijan separately uh, do not reflect in, in anything, um, the association agreements we have with Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, and yet they respond to the, some would say aspirations, but I would say the needs or or the context, let's put it this way, the context 
of these two countries, allowing for a differentiated approach. So I think in that case is literally vital, not to mention, yes, Norway or others, but uh, especially in the Eastern Partnership, I think we have learned some lessons in the last years about the need to respect the partner country agenda and not to impose a vision, and in particular not to impose a binary vision. Uh, here, I'll stop on that, but uh, I, personally, I believe that uh, in some cases, the European Union in the past, quite quite a long, a far away past, but sometimes we've been pushing uh, an approach that was saying, uh, either you're with me or or, or nothing. Uh, and and uh, there are so many different steps that one can take, and uh, even a little bit is better than nothing. That's my approach. Maybe it's a minimalistic approach, a very Mediterranean approach, but I think it's 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 a pra it's a pragmatism of our times. And I think that uh, this this wisdom of of managing to understand and and to to recognize which are the needs and the possibilities, also the concrete possibilities of other countries, also to combine different different partnerships. Uh, and interpret the partnership with the European Union not necessarily as an exclusive one uh, is uh, uh, is a point of wisdom. Sorry, it was long. No, 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 no. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think uh, we are approaching the end of this uh, webinar, but I would still like to ask whether <clears throat> some of the panelists uh, would like to uh, say something very quickly or raise a point that was not raised earlier in your presentations or whether I can just move on to conclude this session. We have four minutes uh, time left. I have a, a, sorry, I forgot one last point, which is uh, almost <laughs> a joke, but not so much. Please don't Please. refer to PESCO as the sleeping beauty. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry for saying that, but there was uh, this was uh, uh, something I always discussed with uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, that was, I think, the one that used the expression mm -hmm. first. Um, first of all, uh, if it was a sleeping beauty, uh, it, she was waken up by all women. Uh, there was no prince. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it was indeed a combination of factors, but uh, um, the, the defense ministers that were leading uh, that differentiation process uh, were all women at the time. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen in Germany, uh, notably, uh, but then also in France, Italy and Spain, which was the core group that started the process. Uh, together with me, uh, we were all women, and we were always joking a lot about this expression because we found it uh, a bit out of touch with reality. Sorry, it, it's a bit of an anecdotal uh, thing, but uh, I felt I needed to share this with you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this as well. Very, very interesting element uh, related to the gender dimension of, of the sleeping beauty or the assumed uh, sleeping beauty. Uh, a, a discussion, I think, which is very, of course, important and topical in, in today's uh, Europe and in the European Union as well. But now I think it's time to conclude this uh, this uh, webinar. I, uh, I have to say that it's been a, a really sort of a roller coaster r ride in terms of the themes and topics related to the EU and European foreign policy. I have to highlight that this has been uh, uh, very much the objective of us to organize this because what what we do in the in the project uh, when looking at the differentiated integration in the CFSB and the CSDB that is exactly a very broad uh, set of issues and topics that we aim to address. It's been a great great pleasure to have a uh, uh, former high representative vice president Federica Mogherini with us. Uh, because you get, you have had uh, there's been the possibility to hear from the front line uh, how differentiation has played out, and I think your analysis has confirmed some of our findings, and I hope that our analysis have brought some new perspectives for the practitioners also following this uh, this event. Uh, we didn't have too much time to discuss the, co uh, the, the consequences of Brexit. Uh, uh, that's, of course, one element which might highlight the role of the lead groups uh, in the future uh, uh, more. And this is, of course, something what has came out uh, in our research that the, that the danger of, of lead groups turning into di directorates, for instance, or sort of a closed uh, uh, collaboration uh, groupings uh, is something that could be uh, more notable in the future when the UK is now at, outside of the EU foreign and security uh, uh, decision-making processes. 
what I also think uh, is is highly important and very exciting uh, is the it's, it's the kind of the outcomes which relate to the external differentiation and which were highlighted also uh, by Mocherini, but also Luigi and Sen Senem. And I think here one interesting research outcome which perhaps uh, deserves more attention is, is, the, is the argument of the paper we have published today, that actually the institutional affiliation, whether you are an accession country, for instance, doesn't necessarily necessarily play a, a, a key role in terms of the depth of of of, of the partnership or, or or collaboration with the EU, and this is of course something which might provide sort of a, uh, which might be actually positive news that it's actually the political alignment which kind of uh, matters more uh, when the world changes and the domex, domestic uh, politics and situations changes also in, 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 in the EU, but also in the partnering countries, including Turkey, UK, uh, and, and so forward. Uh, for me, it's, it's been a very uh, uh, interesting and very exciting uh, 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 task to moderate this, uh, this uh, webinar. I would like to uh, thank also uh, all our followers and watchers uh, through this Teams meeting, and of course, uh, all the presenters, and especially Federica Moccherini for your keynote and active participation, as well as Nicoletta Pirozzi uh, in Rome for your kind opening wor words and also very uh, excellent steering and of the scientific grounds of our major project focusing on differentiated integration. This webinar is now uh, concluded. I wish you all have a nice uh, afternoon or evening, depending where you are. Thank you very much.